Okay, well, welcome to everyone here. I'm Lawrence Kermayer. I direct the Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry here at McGill. This is our Thursday afternoon speaker series that we have most weeks uh, um, uh, these days. Uh, and that run under, runs under several different rubrics. We have um, a series we call Global Mental Health, another one that's called Culture and Community Mental Health, another one that's called Culture, Mind and Brain, uh, and a series within the sort of uh, Culture and Community Mental Health that is uh, the politics of psychic life. So the talk today really spans several of these categories. Uh, they're not, we don't adhere to them very rigidly. Uh, and uh, we're delighted to see all of you. We have. Um, uh, many people joining us from different parts of the world. I see at least th three or four different continents represented here. Uh, and it's one, one of the virtues, perhaps one of the main virtues of our current uh, predicament of having to do things online, uh, that we can really uh, engage with each other across uh, great distances and uh, the far is uh, close and uh, we, can, we can have these conversations. Um, um, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome our guest speaker uh, today, uh, Roy Richard Grinker, who's a professor of anthropology uh, and uh, international affairs at uh, George Washington University. Uh, he is an anthropologist who's worked in East Asia and Korea and, uh, and other places and uh, has had a longstanding uh, interest and commitment and involvement in issues of mental health and uh, understanding of, of stigma. Uh, and um, the occasion for this particular talk is uh, an opportunity to engage with him around uh, his uh, recent book. Um, I'm not centering it properly here, and I, I'd be easier if I had the actual book in my hand instead of this flimsy piece of paper, uh, which, which is called Nobody's Normal, uh, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. And uh, this is an, an important um, uh, reflection on the ways in which stigma is constructed in particular contexts uh, and uh, gives, you know, addresses an issue that's absolutely central to all of us concerned with mental health and culture internationally. Uh, I was just, he was just mentioning before we began that the book has now been translated into many languages, uh, including uh, Turkish and uh, Portuguese and uh, several other languages that are uh, relevant to the people who are here with us today. Uh, so we're absolutely delighted to have this chance to um, uh, learn uh, uh, about this work from him and have it, uh, discuss it with him. The usual format for these talks is uh, 45 minutes to an hour of a presentation and then a good hour of discussion. We're a large group today. So uh, for the discussion, what I would suggest is that if you have comments or reflections as we go, uh, that you put them in the chat. Uh, and uh, we, we can then look at those uh, when we get to the question period and maybe pick some of them. We'll see how many people are here. It, it, it's not going to lend itself to people just, um, you know, speaking out. Uh, we can also try raising hands. We'll see how it works when, when we get to that point. Uh, and um, looking forward to it very much. So I want to thank again, uh, Richard, for joining us. And uh, without any further ado, turn the session over to you. Well, thank you, Lawrence. And hi, everybody. I'm really delighted uh, to be speaking to you, um, particularly delighted because uh, Lawrence, I've admired your work as a researcher and uh, writer and editor for so, such a long time. And McGill has been uh, such a powerhouse uh, with such a robust uh, program uh, at the intersection of psychiatry, uh, anthropology and psychology. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm not gonna use a PowerPoint today. Um, I'm not going to be talking about statistics, and I don't have photographs, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, it is funny that um, I was thinking the other day how I was an early adopter of PowerPoint, and people would say to me when I used it that how brave I was to, to use PowerPoint. And now when I tell people I'm not using PowerPoint, they say, well, you're really brave not to use PowerPoint. Uh, so I don't know if it's brave, but I, 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 I prefer only using it when really necessary uh, and uh, not to have phrases up that I need to repeat. Um, but if anybody ever does have any questions about something, um, my email address is pretty easy to find. Um, for, Lawrence mentioned that I've worked in a number of different places in uh, the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, um, South Africa, South Korea, Namibia, India, 
Um, but for Nobody's Normal Life really was focused more, the drawing examples from other places, focused more on uh, European and American history. Um, for Nobody's Normal, I turned first to my own family. My great-grandfather was a psychiatrist and practiced psychoanalysis briefly uh, between 1909 and 1911, very, very early. Um, my grandfather was a psychiatrist. Uh, he was a very well-known and prolific psychiatrist who um, was the founding editor of the Archives of General Psychiatry, now JAMA Psychiatry. Uh, and my father was a psychiatrist. And my wife is a psychiatrist. And I have a daughter, Isabel, who is uh, 29 years old, diagnosed with autism when she was a little more than two years old and was non-speaking. So I, I, my entire life, I've really been uh, surrounded by discussion and debate around uh, mental health. And I was lucky enough to grow up directly across the street from my grandfather, uh, who uh, you know, even when I was eight or nine years old, talked to me like I was an adult and would give me Saturday seminars on things like differential diagnosis and difference between uh, diagnosing manic depressive illness and schizophrenia. Um, despite living in very different times, all of my family members taught me the same thing, that mental illnesses are a double illness. First, the ailment itself and second, society's negative judgment. And this double illness, my family and even current experts have insisted was the real crux of understanding the treatment gap, the lack of treatment, difficulty of gaining access, difficulty of people talking about mental illnesses, about the shame and the secrecy that has for so long shadowed them. And rather than write a book about what's wrong, there are books, many, many books about what's wrong with psychiatry, what's wrong with psychiatric diagnosis, what's wrong with the DSM, um, many, many books like this. Uh, Tom Minsel's new book, um, I haven't finished it, uh, is about what's wrong and you know why people aren't buying what he and psychiatry are selling. Um, I wanted to write about what has happened that has been helpful and what has happened that has made so many mental illnesses and basically disabilities in general move from being something shameful and frightening to something that is increasingly understood as part of what it means to be human. You know, if we think about autism, for example, you know, once a very narrowly defined condition, uh, considered devastating, but it now, is no longer the narrowly defined condition that's devastating. It encompasses an enormous range of variation that includes great suffering, but also strengths and skills. We've changed autism from something enigmatic into something that we understand. And with the help of Asperger's, which I think served us well uh, for the time it existed, um, autism became a much less stigmatized phenomenon. And we can all, uh, find in our own experience examples of this. For me, the most salient one is uh, the example of my daughter when she graduated from high school. She was the first uh, kid from the high school with a disability to ever give a graduation speech. And um, we um, you know, practiced with her and, and so on. And she went to, to do the speech. And there were 3,000 people at Daughters of the American Revolution Hall across the street from the White House. And uh, when she started to speak, she had her kind of sing-song voice, an odd rhythm, um, odd use of, of language. And most of these people didn't know her. She'd been in pretty much self-contained classes. And you could hear them whispering. And some kids were laughing. Um, and they were talking to each other. They were trying to make sense of who she was. Murmurs whispers, those are the sounds of stigma. And then she got to a part in her speech where she said, people like autism are people with autism like me. And the room just quieted down. Why? Because she had used a framework that they had all learned to understand 
And now she was no longer bizarre. She existed within a framework that they not only knew about, but had come to respect. And so, I mean, we can add to this as well, the fact that she was advocating for herself. And we see this kind of advocacy over and over again. I mean, I'm thinking of the student with Tourette's who stood up in front of the class at G, you know, intro class with uh, 292 students who said he had Tourette's and wanted to let the class know that he had Tourette's so that they understood why he might blurt out something that might surprise them or be, you know, at the wrong time or maybe even offensive. Or the student I had with ADHD who told me that getting diagnosed with ADHD was the best year, best thing that happened in her freshman year, because for the first time, somebody saw that she wasn't lazy, uh, that she wasn't stupid. So the question I ask in this book is that if there are indeed important advances in reducing stigma and increasing access to care, what are the variables that led to it? You know, what are the variables that change stigma and how can we stay the course? And so for this reason, I spend a considerable amount of time chronicling the history of mental illness and psychiatry to locate the, pro the, the processes that are responsible for the ebb and flow of stigma in history. And I write that a couple of things seem pretty clear to me. One of them is that education and awareness, public service announcements and so on, have had limited effect on the reduction of stigma because stigma is not caused by lack of education or ignorance. Another is that medical and scientific advances have not lessened the stigma of mental illness. Why? Because our judgments about mental illnesses have come from our definitions of what, at different times and places, people consider to be the ideal society and the ideal person. So stigma ebbs and flows as the result of very deep structural conditions, in particular capitalism, ideologies of individualism and personal responsibility, and also the very complicated legacies of things like war and racism and colonialism. And so in the first part of the book, um, it's pretty Foucaultian, I, I should say. You know, I'm dealing with the growth of capitalism and the growth of the concept of individualism, uh, personal autonomy and independence. Um, one could argue that it's not just Foucaultian, it's, uh, it's de Tocqueville as well. Uh, because uh, de Tocqueville uh, was one of the most uh, clear writers commenting on the ideals of the American uh, individual. And I think what we want to do when we look at someone like Foucault and, and, and the rise of psychiatry and the rise of uh, different categories of mental illness is to understand that he's not saying that capitalism created mental illnesses. He is saying that capitalism created the conditions in which mental illnesses could be described. It created the conditions for the building of prisons, asylums, places in which large numbers of people were collected, mainly because they did not fit the ideals of their time. In a society that was increasingly urban, we're talking about late 17th century, early 18th century France, in a society that was increasingly urban, in which people were being um, marginalized from their customary rights to land, in which extended families were breaking down into smaller units, you have a situation in which uh, the person who was really uh, to be criticized and disciplined was the person who didn't produce, the person who didn't work, the person who did not conform to the ideals of individualism and autonomy. And in fact, the first asylums had as their mandates that they were uh, institutions to house the idol. And it was in this context that you have for the first time, a large enough number of people considered deviant that scientists could look at them and classify them and say, well, we have the criminals and we have the, the beggars and we have the, the people who are addicted to alcohol and we have the, the, the people who are having psychoses and to separate them out. And alongside the growth of capitalism, of course, was the ongoing enlightenment effort throughout Western Europe to understand not just why humans were different from each other, but what separated humans from other animals. And the asylum and its residents 
who appeared to have diverged from the ideals of humanity provided much of the answer. And it was that, you know, in, in good enlightenment thinking, the humans, unlike animals, had reason, right? As early as 1609, in fact, well, before the beginning of the Enlightenment, we find these lines in Hamlet, where Shakespeare says in the context of Ophelia's madness, that humans without reason may not be human at all. Um, Hamlet says, divided from herself and her fair judgment, without the which we are pictures or mere beasts. In fact, in the records of early 18th century asylums in Europe, Asylum workers often described residents as if they were beasts, people who were uh, impervious to cold, impervious to pain, could withstand uh, uh, very high temperatures and very low temperatures. They were animals that needed to be tamed and controlled. And so throughout the 18th century, the mentally ill appear, France and England, Germany, in, in media from medical textbooks to the fine arts as half human, half animal, as in William Blake's 1795 um, painting of Nebuchadnezzar, the ancient king of, of um, who God punishes, and he punishes him in the book of Daniel with, with madness. Blake depicts um, Nebuchadnezzar naked, crawling on all fours. Um, he has long hair, talons, he's eating grass. The asylum resident had become a symbol of not just irrationality, but also inhumanity. And similarly, physical deformity also suggested a predisposition to animality and mental disease because a malformation of the body was typically visible to all and because there was no yet clear separation between body and mind, the deformed individual was likely also insane. We see this again in Shakespeare in Richard III when Richard, who has a curvature of, of the spine, tells the audience that he is both a physical and mental monster. Um, given the dominant beliefs at that time that one's criminal tendencies were inscribed on the body, and people varied in how they viewed this. Scientists, some said, you know, certain the second toe had this malformation, the eyebrows, the nose, the lips, and so on. Uh, Shakespeare certainly intended Richard to be fated by his nature. And Richard says, I am determined to prove a villain. Control of the body was also crucial to the control of deviance. And in some communities like the Puritans in the American colonies, um, anyone without reason, whether it was a baby, which had no reason because it was a baby or someone else, uh, was an animal that required appropriate discipline to be integrated into the social order. So the Puritans often put babies in wooden go-karts to keep them from crawling because animals crawled, humans didn't crawl. Uh, employed next days to keep a baby's uh, head upright. Sometimes put wooden rods on toddler's spines to try to encourage them to have a fully human erect posture as early as possible. Even Rene Descartes' argument that the, the mind and body were different um, perhaps unintentionally exacerbated the suffering of many people with mental illnesses. Uh, in saying that the body and mind were distinct, he was in effect giving the elites um, and elite scientists an excuse for controlling the poor. Because if the body and mind were separate, scientists reason then perhaps elites were driven by their minds, but the uneducated peasants laboring in the fields or in the factories, they are the ones that are driven like animals. They're driven by instinct and appetite. Hence authorities would have little compunction punishing the bodies of the poor when they didn't do what they were supposed to do or even when they uh, committed minor crimes. Um, for this reason, again, we're going back to Foucault, discipline is administered against the body rather than the mind. And as one result of this objectification of the body of the lower class worker, during much of the 1700s in England, there were well over uh, 125, 130 crimes for which a person could be executed. And the countless people who were executed in England were often referred to in uh, scientific writings and in um, uh, uh, juridical writings as dead commodities. 
dead commodities, people who were the casualties of both capitalist punish, capital punishment and <laughs> the punishment of capital. Uh, witch hunts also show us another way in which the body was the site for the growth of, of capitalism and capitalist discipline. Witch hunts, for example, um, were a form of bodily control that were crucial to the development of capitalist societies during the time of enclosures when people were cut off from their rights of access to land. And in the 16th and 17th centuries, the period in which witchcraft accusations reached their peak, the responsibility to take care of one's poor neighbors had begun to shift from the family and community to institutions like workhouses. Um, and so and other, even in the earliest stages of capitalism, charities found upon, of course, you, you know, you, 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 what happened is that witchcraft kind of pitted the elites against the poor and men against women, neighbors against neighbors. You refuse a poor elderly woman, a widow maybe, who asks for food. The next day, one of your horses dies. You refuse a person who asks for seeds to plant. And for the next week, there's, there's no rain. Witch hunts were central to a struggle over both class and gender. Um, the vast majority of the victims were women, poor women. And this coincided with an intensified patriarchal order aimed at maximizing wealth, which included the number of children one had. Uh, women, sci many scientists believed, were at best morally inferior to men. And at worst, conspirators plotting to undermine economic progress. In, in England, France, and Spain, Sylvia Federici writes, men suspected that women were preventing pregnancies, killing infants, causing childhood diseases, making um, sexual pacts with the devil. And the lower the woman's status, the more likely she was to be ruled by her body, not her mind. The more likely she was driven by instinct and appetite and impulse rather than by rationality. So the transition to capitalism was in a phrase, an attack on the body. Of course, scientists would in due time argue that women were more closely connected to nature than men, that their bodies were designed to function for the reproduction and feeding of babies. I mean, we know menstruation, menses, these are all, you know, moon, they all have the same roots. Menstruation paralleled the movement of the moon. So scientists argued that women were governed more by their bodies than by reason. And if they were governed more by their bodies than by reason, they were more susceptible to insanity. Which is, you know, and the parallel to this is that people who were discriminated against, poor, uh, slaves, so were more susceptible to insanity. In contrast, men were in general designed to control nature, including women. And you know, Emily Martin's work on, on in the, her famous book, The Woman in the Body, makes it clear that it didn't take long for the process of harnessing women's bodies for capitalism would change the language of medicine. Doctors would call childbirth a process of labor and delivery. Uh, menstruation would be called failed production and menopause a factory in decline. Um, in the context of the growth of knowledge about, or not knowledge per se, but you know what I really want to say is the growth of beliefs and ideologies about insanity, the differences between women and men, elites and, and, and non-elites, psychiatry itself was also marginalized. Psychiatry was a very, you know, until the mid 20th century, Psychiatry was an incredibly um, marginalized and stigmatized um, profession. Um, people were little more than, they were considered by other doctors, little more than asylum managers, uh, which is why you find that um, uh, so many of the early psychiatrists in, in uh, Western Europe and Central Europe uh, were Jews because uh, that was the profession, the medical profession open to them. There was, um, there was only one medical profession um, more stigmatized, more disrespected than psychiatry, and that was dermatology. 
um, because it was it consisted mostly of syphil treating syphilitic sores, things like that. And uh, in Austria, people referred to um, derm the field of dermatology um, by the phrase Judenhaut, uh, meaning Jew's skin. At any rate, I'm digressing a little bit there. Uh, this in 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 the emerging views of mental disturbances, doctors encourage people to study the body and behavior of even the most common and private bodily actions to find out what those bo those those uh, bodily functions or those behaviors could tell us about the functioning of the mind. This is all part of, of, of shaming and discriminating certain groups of people as more susceptible to the forms of deviance that were increasingly being uh, encapsulated by terms like, like idiot and ins insane and feeble-minded and so on in this sort of emerging uh, nosology of mental illnesses. And sex was a special curiosity uh, because doctors believed that the sex organs held the key to understanding and treating mental illnesses. And masturbation, pro mostly because it's an, you know, it was considered by doctors an asocial act, uh, sex should be social, not asocial, um, was, was aberrant and was quite open to being politicized. Writing in 1854, a French physician named T. Parvin did not think he was exaggerating when he said, and I'm gonna quote here, neither the plague nor war, nor smallpox, nor a crowd of similar evils have resulted more disastrously for humanity than the habit of masturbation. It is the destroying element of civilized society. Quite a, quite a statement. Um, you know, at the same time, linked to this, scientists are also, um, uh, using as a kind of intellectual scaffolding the differences between men, the sex differences between men and women. Um, if any of you are familiar with the wonderful work of the historian Tom LaCour, Thomas LaCour, um, in his book, Making Sex, um, uh, you, know, you will know that until the late 1700s, uh, European um, anatomists believed that there was just a single sex male and two expressions of that single sex, one of which was women and, and the other men. And that the, the, the increasing push to see the world is divided, uh, not into men and women, but into male and female, uh, gave impetus for doctors to study the genitals. They became a focus of study because they could indicate differences in mental temperament, in cognition, in emotion. By the early 1800s, according to most historians, in moral discourse, there was hardly any overlap between the emotional, uh, fragile woman or female and the active, rational, resolute male. Woman in this two-sex world, Lacour says, that were now constructed as other in more absolute sense than ever before. And if you, you, know, you just have to look at the asylum statistics to see the, the, that the majority of residents in the 1800s in France and in England, um, in the asylums and in the US too, were women. The separation of male and female made it easier for experts to fix stereotypes of femaleness, including a tendency to equate women with mental illness. In 1798, the philosopher uh, Pierre Jean-Georges Cabani claimed that because women appeared to be physically weaker and tended to have a smaller brain volume than men, even when corrected for men's larger body size, their health was always at risk and a woman should therefore be confined to the home where she is best, I'm quoting here, quote, best equipped for the care of children who like her are of underdeveloped reason and destined for confinement. Cabani was certain that unmarried women were at even greater risk for dementia and idiocy and that marriage itself 
was like an asylum that protected women from mental diseases. You know, just to kind of hammer home how much emphasis there was on, uh, on, on sex and women um, as being linked to mental illness. Um, Freud uh, believed with his um, close friend, Wilhelm Fleece in the nasogenital link that the mucous membranes of the nose were related to the mucous membranes of the genitalia. One of, most, one of Freud's most famous dreams in the interpretation of dreams is called the Irma injection dream. That dream is the dream he had when he um, escaped, uh, not escaped, but he, he, was, he thought that his, his patient who had been operated on by, by fleece was going to bleed to death from her nose, nasal surgery. And instead of staying in Vienna, he went skiing or he went to, to Sam Ritz or someplace like that. And he had this dream. Freud had his own nose operated on. Um, and then, um, of course, there is the, you know, the, the famous stories of the invention of the graham cracker, uh, a bland uh, uh, food that was said to um, limit masturbation, and the Kellogg brothers, um, who eventually would start cornflakes, who invented a, 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 a substance of dried oats and uh, dr other, other dried grains, which they um, tried to call granula, but somebody had copyrighted that and that became granola. So that's where we get the term granola from. Uh, these are all aimed at preventing the mental illnesses caused by masturbation. During the 19th century, debates about confinement of the mentally ill also intersected with debates about a different kind of confinement, slavery. Um, it's a really interesting thing to look at how, how pro-slavery advocates from a range of professions in the United States argued strongly against emancipation and tried to marshal scientific data to support their views that women and slaves were uh, susceptible to insanity if given too much freedom and responsibility. Um, Pro-slavery economists, for example, believe that emancipation would have drastic consequences for the American economy. Um, philosophers and religious leaders argued the enslavement of so-called inferior races was a natural institution that shouldn't be abolished. But when it came to doctors, they argued that African uh, that uh, slaves were prone to insanity because they could not constrain their impulses and instincts and that slavery provided a structure to prevent that loss of control. And the arguments around this um, and the way in which data were manipulated in order to try to make the case that, um, that, that, sla that emancipation would create insanity uh, is really fascinating. It's disturbing, of course, but it's also very uh, fascinating. Not only what happened at the time, but what the legacy of some of those views is today and what linkage there may be between those kinds of uh, perspectives in the uh, early and mid 19th century in the US and the way in which um, African-Americans have faced um, obstacles in American mental health care. So, so a lot of the book deals with these historical processes because I am arguing that, that stigma is not something that's simply the result of us not understanding something or a lack of education, but it is a complex set of intertwined processes deeply structured in the history of, of, of European North American medicine, philosophy, and social science. Um, the second part of the book uh, deals with wars. Why wars? Because I'm making the argument there that another variable in influencing the ebb and flow of the stigma of mental illnesses over time is wars. That it is in wars that many mental illnesses were illuminated for the first time in which large numbers of people were kind of like the asylums, 
open to uh, analysis and classification. Like the asylums in which the very idea of mental illnesses first emerged, wars provided a context in which psychiatry and psychology emerged as bona fide disciplines. And I, I'm arguing that the history of the mental health professions shouldn't be characterized as some sort of slow incremental growth of knowledge, but by bursts of knowledge, bursts of knowledge generated during wars, as well as sustained periods of forgetting between wars in which clinicians and researchers remained ignorant of the lessons they learned in previous conflicts. Whereas asylums, however, exacerbated the shame of psychological problems, wars reduced it at least for a time during wartime, where psychiatric disturbances became an acceptable response to stress, whether inside or outside of combat. Kind of interesting here to think about how COVID might, you know, and it's been likened to be a war by many leaders, how COVID itself has kind of made uh, stress and emotional distress and discomfort a kind of universalized thing. I mean, if you tell somebody today that you're, you know, depressed or anxious because of the pandemic, I, you know, people are, are much less likely than three years ago to say, uh, well, you must be a weak, uh, fragile, disturbed person. Um, they're more likely to say, yeah, tell me about it. I'm feeling the same way. Um, the, in both the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, during wars, in addition, um, record numbers of people who were previously unemployed, like people with physical disabilities also found work positions that they, they'd never worked before. Um, so wars, I'm not, you know, this is a very difficult thing to say. No one wants to be an apologist for wars. But what I am saying is that wars are not just aberrations. Wars are productive in the sense that they build on pre-existing um, social, economic, political processes. They are, um, as Peter Barnum has written, you know, part of the fabric of history. They're not just aberrations. Um, in a pattern repeated throughout the 20th century, wars show uh, a, a decrease in the stigma of mental illness, both in the military and outside. And then in, the stigma gradually returns in post-war years when the economic costs of chronic mental illnesses strain budgets, when people with mental and physical disabilities have to yield their jobs to veterans. Um, and that's a difficult pattern to break. But what I am trying to do is tell the story in this one third of the book of how military psychiatry can help us see, it's a kind of a microcosm through which we can see, sometimes in exaggerated form, broad trends in diagnosis, treatment, and moral judgments. So my grandfather, who I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, he, um, he, he was director of psychiatric operations in the Tunisian campaign, in the North African theater uh, during World War II for a time, uh, a little over a year. He was the director of their psychiatric operations. So he's stationed in North Africa. And he and his colleagues realized for the first time just how common mental illnesses were, how stressors that, that originate outside one's body can cause emotional problems, that we needed to train more doctors to be psychiatrists. And more importantly, this is the really great um, advance of World War II um, that for psychiatry, that mental illnesses were treatable outside of asylums and hospitals, and even through short-term therapy. In fact, as a direct response to the war, Harry Truman established the NIMH. As a direct response to the war, he makes it clear, because of mental illnesses during World War II and what we have learned, we now are establishing the NIMH. And he ordered the military to write a manual for the diagnosis of mental disorders to ensure a degree of standardization among clinicians and researchers. That military document called Medical 203 was then adapted for the civilian community as the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders One, in other words, the DSM-1. So it's written by the military and then adapted by the military in 1953 for civilian use. 
Um, however, you know, by 1973, the civilian psychiatric establishment in line with general opposition to the Vietnam War had developed resolutions to ban military psychiatrists from the American Psychiatric Association. You know, they, they were, they were anti-war. Um, but it also seems that they had already forgotten, or perhaps they never knew, because this is not exactly a well-known history, that their own ideas and practices, many of them, like the concept of the therapeutic community, group therapy, psychiatric screening as a preventive measure, the treatment of acute stress reactions, short-term psychotherapy, community psychiatry, psychometric testing had all begun in the military. Which is not to say that there was stigma because stigma existed, but again, in a, in, in a way that we can see how complicated stigma is. In World War, World War I is a good example. I'll use World War I as the best example of the sort of interaction, intersection between stigma and um, social and political inequality. Um, the story of World War II shows how patients and doctors drew on pretty limited medical knowledge and pretty limited idioms of range of idioms of distress to shape the symptoms and treatments of mental illnesses. All of you who are you know, familiar with medical anthropology, and even if you're not familiar with any medical anthropology, but you're in a medical field, know that the story of any sickness is one that doctors and patients weave together in which they find consensus about what constitutes a culturally legitimate um, and sensible symptom at a particular moment in history. By the time the war began, World War I, uh, the majority of Americans and British expressed their emotional distress through bodily symptoms like fatigue or paralysis. You can see um, films of people walking uh, with an odd gait or being unable to stand up because they're so dizzy. Um, what we think of today as mental disorders were in the past, or at least were in World War I, problems of the nerves rather than the mind. And if anybody sought care for a uh, mental condition that wasn't going to involve going to an asylum, they went to their GP, they went to their general practitioner, or maybe a neurologist. Doctors didn't have much interest in treating people with emotional issues. One reason why my great grandfather got out of psychoanalysis, because he didn't like it. At an unconscious level, patients knew to express their complaints through the body. Um, another um, historical pattern um, that I, I think is, is important to um, understand is just how social inequality then intersected with the um, construction of ideas about mental illnesses. And at the beginning of World War I, there were only about 50 psychiatrists in the military, US military. Though at the time they weren't called psychiatrists, they were called neuropsychiatrists for an army of more than 4 million. And most had no psychiatric training at all. They were called 90 day wonders because they were people who were orthopedic surgeons who were told to be, you know, to work as psychiatrists. And you know, they tended to look for and treat physical symptoms. And patients describe their complaints almost entirely in physical terms. And so how did doctors think about physical symptoms, particularly among people who, ha who had been nowhere near combat? It was troublesome. They didn't know how to do it. And at first they described it as hysteria. Um, but it was troublesome because it was feminizing. Anthropologist and psychologist Charles Myers was one of the first scientists to realize the great symbolic value of changing the name of the diagnosis. Patients had invented a new term, shell shock, likely as a way to interpret their symptoms biologically rather than psychologically and to reaffirm their sense of manhood and decrease the stigma of being feminized. Well, Myers, uh, reasoned that since the war was linked to masculinity and masculinity and insanity and sanity were linked to the ability to control one's feelings, shell shock should replace hysteria. And the term took off. And by 
May of 1917, 15% of British soldiers had already been discharged from the military with a diagnosis of shell shock, most of them having been nowhere near any fighting. Um, so a lot of these soldiers got diagnoses of shell shock. Well, what about women? Women did not get diagnosed with shell shock because they weren't seeing combat in the same way that men were seeing combat. I mean, if they were diagnosed with something, it was hysteria and they were immediately discharged from the war. Officials in France, in Belgium, England, and the US considered women of less value than combat soldiers and made very little effort to retain them. In addition, when doctors thought about war trauma, they didn't think about interpersonal trauma that occurred outside of combat, like the trauma of witnessing the effects of warfare, um, like in hospitals, uh, in, at, at graveyards. They did not include interpersonal trauma that occurred outside of combat, like sexual violence. Yet women were exposed to just as much violence, if not more, than men. All of this, more confirmation of how social inequality underwrites the history of the stigma of mental illness. Both diagnosis and psychiatric symptoms varied according to social status and military rank. So if you were an enlisted man in the British or American army, you were much more likely to experience gross bodily symptoms like paralysis, mutism, and deafness. If you were of higher status, you were more likely to experience um, your emotional distress in terms of fatigue. Many officers had the same symptoms too, but the higher the rank, the more likely they had the features of, of, of neurasthenia, like insomnia or fatigue that were associated with mental disturbances among elites in civilian life. And in England, the class system often eclipsed compassion. So um, words like uh, malingering and hysteria were used for lower class soldiers instead of shell shock to characterize their symptoms. So hysteria was used in already, continued to be used in populations that were already marginalized, like working class soldiers, Jewish soldiers, Irish soldiers, colonial subjects like West Africans. Class also influenced the way shell shock was described in Germany and France. In Germany, hysteria was more frequently used as a diagnosis for working class soldiers whose impairments were evidence of them becoming what, what the Germans called work shy. In other words, diagnosis could reinforce your already inferior position, proving that your sickness perhaps was determined by reality. Uh, sorry, reality, predetermined by heredity, I'm sorry. In France, for example, uh, Didier Fassin writes, quote, the violent event made neurosis manifest, but it did not cause neurosis. The problem was with the patient, not the war. World War II was different. World War II really functioned to bring psychiatry out of the asylum because of the growth of psychoanalysis. It was in World War II that scientists for the first time realized just how common mental illnesses were and you know, that you didn't have to treat mental illnesses in, in an asylum, in an institution. Um, in fact, uh, the physical symptoms too, um, that you saw in World War I, like the awkward gait and inability to walk, uh, those kinds of, of uh, gross bodily, um, things like paralysis, deafness, mutism, um, those nearly disappeared as people began to describe their distress in more emotional terms. And by the end of World War II, the New York Times, uh, in a dramatic, you know, odd and premature statement, suggested that my grandfather's work had eliminated the shame of mental illness in the military. Um, the pilots they treated, the men who had flown dozens of missions but had mental illnesses were, the New York Times said actually the very strongest of soldiers because the weak soldiers would never have made it through combat. That Grinker had in effect normalized mental illnesses in the war. Um, uh, quite premature because, you know, by the end of World War II, we start to see stigma increasing. And then it is only when we get to the end of the Korean War, you see Sylvia Plath write that, quote, a psychiatrist is the god of our age. In the 
third part of the book, um, I really take on the word normal a little bit more directly to talk about how the term developed and how it became used as a kind of damaging illusion. The word normal as we think about it today is, you know, is like some, you know, like being typical or something you aspire to is rather new. Um, even in the mid 20th century in the US, the word normal was more a mathematical term that meant the average. Um, one of the people who was concerned that the term normal might be used to try to characterize behavior, sexuality in a positive way, as opposed to the abnormal, um, was Kinsey. Um, and in Kinsey's work on sex, he tried really hard to impress his own perspective, saying that we should not be using normal and abnormal loosely in everyday language. They were simply poles that people were starting to use on a continuum of culturally variable attitudes. They did not belong anywhere in, uh, in, in science or in colloquial usage. But he wrote so much against the concept of normality that the historians Peter Kreil, Australian historians Peter Kreil and Elizabeth Stevens write that Kinsey's works were one of the main conduits by which the term normal actually moved into widespread circulation and it became more popular than, than before. And for the first time after Kinsey, normal becomes used by ordinary people, not just statisticians. And gradually normal came to mean more than average. It became the ideal, something to aspire to. One re reason that Kinsey's critique also failed to stop normal from becoming a household word um, that could be used to um, praise someone and stigmatize another um, was that his argument was based on statistics rather than, than sentiment. Um, you know, he, he found that uh, it was more typical than atypical, for example, for a man to have some homosexual experience um, in his life. And the way that um, Kyle and, and Stevens write, they say, quote, even if you prove something is statistically normal, like homosexual sex, what ends up being more important is what people already believe to be normal. And she added, even the most even the best, they, they say, um, even the best and most heroic critiques of the normal don't bring that concept crumbling down. Uh, for my grandfather's part, he hated the word normal. He didn't like to use it. He, if he used it, he would say almost normal or something like that. He didn't like it. And he did this really interesting study in 1961 um, where uh, he, he noted that most of the studies that people did of people with mental illnesses would ascertain who in a particular community qualified for a mental illness and who did not. And they would remove those who did not meet the criteria for a mental illness and focus on the ones that did. Makes sense. You're studying mental illness, you study the sick people. But he said, what if we do the opposite? Let's look, let's, let's get rid of the mentally ill people from our sample and we'll look at all those people who actually do not meet the criteria and who are then quote unquote normal. And in a very long paper in the um, Archives of General Psychiatry, which was published maybe the next year, 1962, 1963, um, he uh, showed that the people that he studied quite intensively um, in a all male uh, suburban Chicago college um, the, the people who did not meet the criteria for mental illness um, were really average academically, that they were uncreative compared to others, they were rigid, they had little ambition, in a word, kind of boring. And he actually wrote in the archives the following question, quote, are the compulsive character and rigidity the sharply focused and limited interests, the use of activity to maintain comfort, the absence of creativity, fantasies and introspection. Are these the costs we have to pay for stability and mental health? It was an amazing thing to say actually in you know, that early, in the early 60s, because we're talking about 
you know, way before neurodiversity. And it was such an unusual question to ask that in the next sentence, um, he, he felt the need to tell the reader that that question was not a joke. Um, you know, this is decades before neurodiversity advocates urged us to appreciate the value of different kinds of cognitions, intelligences, and personalities before my students started wearing t-shirts that read, I hate normal. Um, my grandfather was suggesting, and I should say my father too, because he was a co-author, excuse me, on the paper. So my grandfather and father were suggesting that normality was crippling and that some degree of mental difference might be necessary for humanity to remain vibrant, creative, and diverse. The, um, the end of the book uh, deals more with the way in which the stigma of mental illness um, is related to the earlier um, question that I discussed about the distinction between body and mind. And, and looking at uh, resistance in populations to viewing physical symptoms as somehow related uh, psychiatrically or psychologically. Because if body and mind are distinct, then diseases of the body are diseases of the body. Um, so many people who have bodily symptoms that may be psychogenic, may therefore not seek or accept psychiatric care, except as a last resort, you know, often pursuing unnecessary medical tests, even serious complications. So it's looking at a different kind of way in which stigma is um, kind of integrated into society. Um, that, that, that people find that a mental illness is much more stigmatizing than most physical illnesses. So if we think, for example, about the controversy over a recent condition called Havana syndrome. This is the syndrome in which um, uh, embassy workers from Canada, the US, uh, in Cuba uh, developed, um, I don't know if it's called an embassy, but the diplomats in, in Cuba uh, developed uh, a variety of symptoms of headaches, pain, weakness, fatigue that they suspected was due to some kind of um, uh, radio signal or microwaves that were being directed at them. And when mental health professionals said, you know, this could very well be, you know, a um, psychological condition expressing itself in, um, in, in terms that are, are physical um, and therefore more appropriate or acceptable to the people, what Freud would call the sense of symptoms, uh, people became outraged and said things like, we're not making up our symptoms. They are real. Um, there's, there are similar issues with a variety of contested diseases um, for which you know, there continues to be a lot of debate, whether it's Gulf War syndrome or chronic Lyme disease. Um, and it's very, very difficult to tread on this ground. Um, it's very sensitive. And my position is that, um, that the stigma of mental illness is actually keeping a lot of people from getting mental health care that could really help them, whether their condition is psychogenic or not. I mean, if you have cancer and you're depressed, you should be getting treatment for cancer. Um, not because there's something wrong with you um, psychologically, but because you have depression. And it may not be something that somebody treats because they see it through the stigmatized lens of mental illness. About a third of all patients um, visits to a neurologist today. And that includes people with numbness, vision, speech impairments, seizures, paralysis, have no medical finding, meaning there's no measurable or observable data no discernible cause for the symptoms. The only medical finding is the symptom, right? And doctors often, neurologists especially, give some of these patients a diagnosis of functional neurologic symptom disorder. Yet clinicians are reluctant to tell patients what functional neurologic symptom disorder really means. It's the modern term for conversion disorder, physical symptoms that can't be explained medically, which is once the modern term for psychosomatic disorders, which was once the modern term for hysteria. 
they know that patients will react to that diagnosis if they're being accused of fabricating, as if they are being accused of fabricating the symptoms, as if the doctor is saying, uh, your sickness is not real. And so for fear of stigmatizing patients, doctors choose their words very, very carefully when referring patients with unexplained somatic complaints to a mental health care professional, often telling the patient, you know, something like a therapist might be able to help you cope with your physical ailments but abandoning the words conversion or psychogenic or psychosomatic. To further obfuscate the psychosomatic, a few years ago, the American Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine changed its name to the Academy for Consultation Liaison Psychiatry, the branch of medicine of uh, psychiatry that's concerned with the intersection of medical and psychiatric illness. And why did they make this change? Because of the stigma associated with the word psychosomatic. Yet many doctors have never even heard of the term consultation liaison psychiatry. And here's the problem. The problem is that who knows how many people who suffer terribly from a range of physical conditions could benefit from treatment within the psychological professions. But patients and doctors often collude to separate the body from the mind. See, the diseases of the body is real and those of the mind is somehow fictive even though that separation is the source of stigma and a barrier to mental health care. In fact, one could argue that in the United States, the process of medicalization, which we attempt to, to see things through the lens of medicine, whatever that uh, might be, um, encourages what doctors call somatization, that patients are comprehending physical complaints, including benign discomforts, as if they were physical diseases or potential physical diseases. And then it is entirely possible that doctors then exploit the financial incentives of the medical industrial complex to treat them. The reaction, and I'll, this will, I'll, I'll finish up very, very soon now, of many leaders in psychiatry to the ongoing stigma of mental illness is to argue that if it's the case that the body is not as stigmatized as the disease of the mind. Why not recognize that all mental illnesses are biological and that they are illnesses like any other illness? If we can find out how mental illnesses, the biological, molecular, genetic basis of mental illnesses, the neurological basis of it, maybe we will reduce the stigma because then it would be a neurobiological problem, not something wrong with you as a person. And the argument at first makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense because the majority of people with a mental illness receive little or no mental health care. But the majority of people with broken legs, they'll get health care. For people with schizophrenia, the average time from first psychosis to treatment in the US is 74 weeks, which is why Nancy Andreasen famously said that mental illness should be seen as you know, a broken brain. It's the broken brain model shifts responsibility from the person to the organ. But there are also many reasons why the illness, like any other perspective, does not make sense. First of all, in trying to um, use a medical model for mental illness, psychiatry is emulating a false idol, as if, you know, as if medicine is all very scientific and organ specific. Um, you know, there's the joke about internists that they know everything but do nothing. Um, and, you know, take headaches. For example, you know, one of the most common complaints, people go to doctors to get treatment, but they, you know, they're rarely treated with the assistance of brain imaging or a diagnosis other than headache or other laboratory tests because most or a lot of medical work is educated estimates and guesses. Even like when cardiologists determine whether a certain blood pressure level is high, low, or normal, because those levels that constitute, you know, prehypertensive, hypertensive um, conditions are made by consensus among a group of people. And psychiatric conditions may appear to us to be less objective or fact-based only because psychiatrists yet haven't yet developed the numbers to fool us into thinking that they're more objective than they are. Um, I could go on and say more about this. There are many surveys that show that, that the more throughout the world, 
uh, that show that the more people think about mental illnesses as neurobiological, uh, the, um, the more they actually stigmatize mental illnesses, or at least that it doesn't do anything to reduce it. Uh, Bernice Pesco-Solito's famous study showed that from 1996 to 2006, the American public increasingly saw mental illnesses in general and depression, schizophrenia in particular, as neurobiological, but they wrote, in no instance was a neurobiological conception associated with significantly lower odds of stigma. So we have a lot of work ahead of us in decreasing stigma, but we're, we're seeing a lot of progress. And a lot of that progress has come through um, very, very deep, again, you know, structural conditions that have nothing to do with somebody's intentional effort to educate or create a, a public service announcement or a new class in school. Uh, it ha stigma is the result of the kind of person that we um, consider to be a good person. Stig mental, well, the normal and the abnormal are variants of the good and the bad. And so if we can change what we value, we're more likely to change stigma. So if we can value the person who's the computer nerd or geek, rather than see that person as weird or bizarre, we may actually be decreasing the stigma of, um, of, of autism. If we see something like um, uh, depression as a spectrum, that we're all, we're all on to some degree, then we may, may also be decreasing the stigma of depression. And so the variables that influence the rise or the diminution of stigma are really about the kind of person that is valued and how those values are linked up with very complicated processes that include sex, gender, social inequality and so on. And I hope I've given you a sense of that complexity in focusing on these different areas of capitalism, the, uh, the, uh, the way in which wars change our views of mental illness and in the um, uh, distinction between the body and mind. And so I'll, I'll end there, thank you. Thank you very much for that extraordinary uh talk that really puts things in you know the grand sweep of uh, recent history the last several centuries of history and um i think really helps us to think about the larger social structural and uh, economic and uh, and value systems that shape stigma yeah i want to thank you very very much uh, for being here with us i hope everybody's going to go and read the book now uh if they haven't already uh, and uh, we, you know, this is a, a conversation to be continued. I think it's very important to all of us, both from a research point of view in terms of some of the things we study, but also from an action point of view in terms of trying to help people find the right languages that will really foster, uh, you know, healthy relationships and support. Thank you all so much, and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Um, Appreciate the invitation. Thanks. Bye. Take care.